Hello, this is Britt Caswell with another example video. In today's video, I'm covering example 3 from lesson 10-1 in the Savas Realize Algebra 1 textbook. Uh, today's video, probably going to be a long one, uh, it's talking about the rate of change of the square root function. Uh, so contrary to popular belief, whenever you see the rate of change, we're going to call that slope, friends. All right, so when we talk about rate of change, it's essentially a slope, but it's not really the slope of the function. All right, if I look at the square root function right here, this function has a slope that's pretty much vertical. But as I move towards positive infinity, this slope is starting to flatten out. So there is a continuously changing slope on the square root function. So when we talk about the average rate of change here, the slope itself is describing a line that is a straight line that connects to the endpoints that are described here in these intervals. All right, so this example is asking us to compare a couple of average rate of change. All right, a couple of slopes. So these first two x values here are describing this blue segment. And they want to know what the slope is of that blue segment. And then these two x values are describing the green segment. And so the green segment is right there. Now visually, if I'm looking at that, I could see that the blue section is a whole lot steeper than the green section. And so that helps me when I go to do my calculation of the slope formula. It tells me that I should get a bigger number for the blue than I do for the green. All right. Also looking at these two line segments, I should see that I should get a positive slope. So if those two conditions are not meant or not met, sorry, um, I'll know that I made a mistake somewhere. And so those are some kind of little things that you should keep an eye out for to kind of check yourself so you don't wreck yourself. All right. Now the slope formula is right here. We say that the slope is equal to the change in our y values divided by the change in our x values. And so if I look at the values that they give me, they're telling me what my x1 and my x2 values are. Now remember, to go from having your x values to having your y values, all that you do is you plug them into the function. So let's try it with the blue one. Now down below, if I'm doing x2 minus x1, I'm going to do 0.3 minus 0. So that's the easy part. So if I know my x2 is 0.3, to get my y2, I plug it into this equation. So I'd get the square root of 0.3. And there's a minus sign in my formula. And then to get my y1 value, I plug the x1 value into the square root function there. So that's what it looks like. Now, before I plug this into a calculator, I kind of want to clean it up. So down below, 0.3 minus 0 is just 0.3. So that's easy. Now, up top, the square root of 0 is just 0. And subtracting 0 doesn't do anything. So this entire term just goes by Felicia. We don't need it. So when I go over to my calculator, I'm actually going to use Desmos for this. Um, I'm only going to do the square root of 0.3 divided by 0.3. All right, so I just set up a couple square root things because it's annoying to type. Now be careful typing it in here. Can I zoom in on this? I don't know if I can even zoom in on this. Maybe not. Bummer. Um, but be careful when you type into this. Um, if I put divided by 0.3 here, that isn't the same thing as what I have there. Notice that the square root radical symbol is covering both parts of this of the division there. We don't want that. So on Desmos, I use the arrow key to get out of the square root and see how it kind of keeps that square root up top. All right, now I'm just going to use my snipping tool to put that. Understand this is an approximation, right? Because this term is irrational. And irrational terms, they go on and on and on for forever without any repeat. 
All right, so that was the blue one. So now, remember, I have a positive number, so that that's a good thing. All right, now when I go to do my calculation for the green one, I should get something that is smaller than that 1.8-ish, okay? So I'm going to say m equals, so my x1 is 0.3 and my x2 is 0.6. All right, now to get my y values, again, I'm plugging these x values into the square root function. So my, my x2 was 0.6, so I'm plugging in 0.6. And then my x1 was 0.3, so I plug in to the function and get the square root of 0.3. Now notice, these are two separate square roots. All right, you cannot just put a mega square root there. All right, that doesn't work. They're not equivalent. All right. If this was multiplication, you could combine the radicals, but addition and subtraction, you have to keep them as separate square roots. Now, there's not much friendly cleanup I could do here. Like I said, I can't really combine those things, so they have to stay separate. Uh, but down below, 0 0.6 minus 0 0.3 is just 0 0.3, so that helps a little bit. So if I go to Desmos, I have the square root of 0 0.6, um, minus the square root of 0.3. Now notice, if I move out of the radical house and I put a division, do you see how it just divides the 0.3? I don't want that. Because the 0.6 and the 0.3 up top are both being divided by the 0.3 down below. So to get around that, we use grouping symbols to help ensure that I'm dividing what needs to be divided. And see, now when I put that division there, it, it crossed it under everything that I needed it to. So be very careful with how you type things in. And whatever calculator you're using, make sure to really practice with it before you take any assessments. I see it all the time. Kids don't know quite how to type things into their calculator and uh, get some of those wrong answers, which is quite unfortunate. All right, so here I'm going to put my approximately sign right there. Again, because this would be a rounded number. This should go on for forever. So notice, we did get a positive value that came out of the square root. And if I compare it, well, 1.8 is about two and a half times that of the 0.75. Let me check on that number. 1.8 and 0.75. Yeah, 2.4 times. So it's a word question, so I'm just typing out a word answer. So I'm going to say the blue segment is about 2.4 times steeper than the green segment. That's one way to say it. Or you could actually compare the numbers, something like that. Now, the thing that makes this a really long video, friends, is because now they ask us to do that same thing uh, again. But now, instead of it being just the square root of x, it's the square root of 2x. All right, so let's go ahead and try this out. So they give us two separate intervals. All right, this first interval is from 8 to 10. I'm going to call this one our blue one. So this 8 is our x1. And this 10 is our x2. So just kind of a reminder, the slope formula is the change in your y values divided by your change in your x values. So those x values are real easy. So down below I have 10 minus 8. So when I go to get my y values, I'm going to plug these x values into my function. So x2 was 10, so I'm going to have the square root of 2 times 10. And then my x1 value was 8, so for y1, I'm going to get 2 times 8. Now, before I take this to Desmos, we're going to definitely do a bit of a cleanup step here. So first thing, I can multiply the stuff inside the square roots, right? So 2 times 10 is 20. Uh, 2 times 8 is 16. 
and down below 10 minus 8 is 2. So that's a good way to clean it up. Um, here, I could also take that square root of 16, can't I? All right. Now, if I was real persnickety, um, I could uh, take out the, the set of twos that would come out of here. Because 20 is 2 times 2 times 5, and then divide everything by 2. I'm not going to go that wild. Uh, I don't think Savas does either. I don't remember. Um, but I'm just going to get a decimal approximation. So I'm going to have root 20 minus 4 divided by 2. So if I use this tool, remember you want to use parentheses because you're going to divide everything by 2. And I'm getting about 0.236. Alright, so now we're going to do that same thing now, but for the 10 and the 12. Alright, so the 10 is my new x1, the 12 is my new x2. So I'm going to put 12 minus 10 down here in the bottom of my square root function. So to get my y2, I take the x2 value and I plug it in. So here I'd have 2 times 12 minus, and then I'm going to plug my x1 value in, the square root of 2 times 10. Then we go through our cleanup step. Uh, so 2 times 12 is 24, and 2 times 10 is 20. And down below, 12 times 10 is... And so I'm not going to freak out about too much more cleaning there. All right, that's that's fine. But that's because I want to get a, a decimal approximation. Now what's nice about these is a lot of times they're very similar, so I only have to adjust this expression just a little bit. All right. Always double check yourself. Make sure you typed in what you intended to type in. There it is. Now, one thing I want to point out, all right, uh, just before we call it quits. If I think about a square root function, I'm just going to draw a very rough graph, very rough graph. It looks like this, right? So the further away from that origin that I get, the less steep my graph should be, right? Because it kind of flattens out as you move to the right. So if I look, the, the function that I had to the left, which was from 8 to 10, was a slope of 0.23 and the function that I had that was to the right was 0.21 so it's a little bit smaller and that tells me that all right it should be where it's at all right like you just want to use that kind of common sense to help check your work a little bit uh, but there we have it guys um, I know it asked me to find h of 8 h of 10 and h of 12 they're all just kind of embedded right there to be honest with you I don't like doing it, in, doing it in separate parts. Anyway, that is the rate of change of the square root function. Until next time.